Good morning. Good morning. So today we're going to finish up or maybe finish up indefinite integrals. Um, so yesterday we looked, I mean, not indefinite integrals and proper integrals. Yesterday we looked at cases where we have a definite integral from A to B, but one of the limits of integration is an asymptote of the function. Uh, what I've drawn on the board, the asymptote is down on the bottom, but at the end of class, we looked at cases where the asymptote was up in the top. So the picture we have here, we've got this asymptote, we've got the x-axis, I'll assume the function is positive for ease of drawing the picture, and the curve is crawling up the x-axis, and it crawls up forever, so that if we talk about the region under the curve, the region under the curve is in one sense infinite. I mean, because it doesn't have any upper bound. The region itself just goes up and up. But even though the region goes on forever, it can have a finite area a kind of unintuitive idea maybe, but we'll see that kind of unintuitive idea a lot in calculus. So there's one sort of improper integral of this type that we have yet to see. So what if we're on an interval from A to B, and there's an asymptote right there in the middle of the interval. And let me see if I can. I mean, drawing pictures with asymptotes in the middle of the interval is no, uh, no hard task. We have um, old one divided by x from negative one to one, for example, or one divided by x squared from negative one to one, or something like that. I mean, up and the, uh, the trick here, it's a little tedious, but it increases the number of integrals. The trick is really pretty intuitive, <clears throat> and it's based on the idea that if you have a function and you have an integral from A to B, you can divide that interval up and the integral from A to B is then the integral from A to C plus the integral from C to B. So since we already know how to deal with vertical asymptotes 
when they're at the beginning or the end of the interval, we rewrite the integral as two integrals with vertical asymptotes at the beginning and the end. Let's see, um, there we go. So for example, I don't actually, I don't actually know whether this is going to converge or not, but we can look at the integral from negative one to one of one over x squared dx. And we can write it. I mean, first we have to make the observation and let me pause a moment here. You know, we're in the in improper integral section. So, I mean, you see an integral like that, you say, oh, well, it's not defined somewhere. Otherwise, we would not be talking about it in this section. But on tests and stuff, you know, I, there's no guarantee that I'm going to tell you this is an improper integral. I mean, on the integration test, I just give a lot of integrals and you have to, uh, on your own, recognize whether they're improper or not. <laughs> but this, um, this is improper, zero, is a vertical asymptote. And I think in answer to, I said I didn't know quite what was going to happen. I now suspect that these, um, this integral does not converge, that the area under the curve is infinite, but let's find out. So as I say, I mean, it, these problems aren't don't suddenly become super hard. It's just maybe a little tedious because now you have two integrals and both of those integrals are limits. So you have to write down the limit notation for both of them. But fundamentally, we're going to just take two integrals here. And we know that taking two integrals, I say that so cavalierly, um, taking integrals can be quite difficult as we have seen. Um, but I have not chosen to make our life super difficult by putting an integral on the board that requires partial fractions or something. What is the integral of one over x squared? Negative one third x to the negative third. Um, both. Oh, x to the negative first. Uh, yes, and with because of that, without yeah. the negative one third as yeah, well. Yeah, so be negative. And what we're doing here is that we're remembering that one over x squared is x to the negative second. So when we integrate it, the power bumps up. And then you divide by the new power and dividing by negative one gives you a negative sign. So 
Remember it? As n goes to infinity, negative one, wait, as n goes to zero, sorry. Well, we sort of gave away what we're doing next. As n goes to zero of negative one over n plus one. And this limit does not exist. Um, this is a definite form. A constant, if they're taking a limit and they're getting any constant other than is zero divided by zero, that limit is not going to exist. And the good news is that we're actually done. I said we'd have to take two integrals that did not end up being the case because an improper integral with a vertical asymptote between the limits of integration is taken, as we have seen, by breaking this into two and in order for this improper integral to converge both of these must converge So the instant that we find that one of these does not converge, that one of these does not exist, the problem is over. The improper integral we were looking at does not exist. <laughs> so let's see if I cannot give an example where the improper integral does exist, something like, we can keep, well, no, just for variety, let's mess around with our limits of integration slightly. But the real change is, let's replace this x with, or this x squared, I should say, with the cubed root of x. If I'm doing my, uh, if I'm thinking about this problem correctly, here is an improper integral that is going to converge. And one over, let's see, the cubed root for decimals purposes and also integration purposes is going to be x to the one third. Uh, very nice symmetry, which we sadly broke by going from negative two to one instead of negative one to one. <laughs> and my claim is that I think this is going to, <clears throat> and I, I showed the graph, but somehow didn't make the actual fundamental observation. This is an improper integral zero is once again a vertical asymptote.
So we break this into two. The uh, the good part is that we only have to find an antiderivative once. I mean, we have two integrals, but they'll both be the integral of one over the cubed root of x. So we don't have to take two integrals, if, if that's clear. Um, Again, I understand the desire not to write down a bunch of stuff, um, especially like on the homework and you're on the, your 10 problems in, but we want our notation to be good here. So the limit as n goes to zero and we're going from negative two to n. So what's the antiderivative of one over the cubed root of x? Three halves x to the two thirds. Three halves x to the two thirds. Thank you very much. For anyone who doesn't see that um, right away, this is x to the negative one third. So Negative one thirds bumps up to two thirds. And when we divide by two thirds, it becomes three halves. So the limit as n goes to zero of three halves n to the two thirds minus three halves times negative two to the two thirds and I mean, I'm sure textbooks would rather I frame this in a more formal way, but in practice, if you can stick the limit of integration in and it doesn't give you an error, then you can take the limit by sticking that, in this case, zero, just by sticking it in, so... This doesn't give us an error. Zero to the two thirds is perfectly well defined. Negative three over two times two to the two thirds, I should say times negative two to the two thirds. Three over, okay, let's try that again. Three over two times negative two to the power of two divided by three and there was a negative sign in front of all of that. Negative 2.381 or thereabouts.
And the problem is not, of course, done this time. Um, last time we got away with only computing one of the integrals, but that was only because the integral we were trying to compute didn't exist. Here we need both the integrals so we can add them together. And when I say both the integrals, maybe this is something that I should have written explicitly. We're breaking this up at zero. So that's the integral we just found. That integral we still need. And what I was trying to say earlier is that at least the second integral is a little quicker. I mean, it's not a huge deal here because integrating one over the cubed root wasn't very difficult, or I shouldn't say that. I should say it didn't require at least any time consuming techniques. But now we can just, we found the integral once, it's three halves x to the two thirds. However much work finding the integral hook, we do not have to do that work a second time. The limit as n goes to zero of three halves, one to the two third is one. I, mean, I, can, I can write that. Three halves, one to the two thirds minus three halves n to the two thirds. And again, you know, our textbook wouldn't like it because what of this, what about all the problems that the textbook lab grows to work out badly? But in practice, you do take limits just by sticking the limit of integration in there. Um, And we wind up with three halves. So, negative two point three eight one plus three halves. is negative 0.881. This answer makes sense. I mean, at least in the following way, if we look at if we look at the graph one more time, um, where 
when we have a function that's sometimes above the curve and sometimes below the curve, we've got essentially positive areas and negative areas. So we've got this area here, and this is negative, and then we've got, let me see, what don't you like as most? Ah, it doesn't like, uh, Yes, most are being a kind of a pain here. There we go. We've got this area, and this area is positive. And you can see, I mean, this curve is symmetric around the origin. And this area is bigger than this area because we're looking at a larger interval where the function is negative. It's negative from negative two to zero. It's only positive from zero to one. It um, makes sense at least. Ugh. That's sort of crammed in there, isn't it? But it makes sense, at least, that our answer is negative. If we took this problem and... Well, let, let's not take this problem and modify it slightly. I was just going to observe that if instead of negative 2... We'd kept negative one to one, the integral would have wound up then being zero because of that symmetry around the origin. The negative and the positive pieces would have canceled each other out. <laughs> but you have to be really careful when you're discussing symmetry around the origin in that way. Because, well, I didn't do, didn't do a problem. Let's just go to Desmos. And let's clear all this out. One over X is also symmetric around the origin, but something else occurs. With one over X, neither of these individual integrals exist. So you have um, symmetry around the origin, but the improper integral is not defined. In fact, since it's only going to take a single integral to show this. Why don't we look at this? So the break point, as it were, is zero. This is not defined at zero. To show that this doesn't exist, 
which I'm claiming is true, it suffices to show that one of those integrals doesn't exist. Let's look at the limit as n goes to zero. The integral from negative one to n of one over x dx The integral of one over x is what? Thank you, you are correct. I keep, because I know it's the next topic, I keep making that mistake and writing going to infinity instead of going to whatever we're actually going to. Um, from negative one, to N. Okay, and then this does not exist because, I mean, speaking a little informally, but the natural log of zero is negative infinity. Yeah. There is a vertical asymptote going to negative infinity. And a natural log of one, I mean, the, the details scarcely matter, but the natural log of one happens to be zero. So this integral does not exist. So this entire integral does not exist. In particular, what you do not have, it's true that the first integral is negative infinity, and it's true that the second integral is positive infinity, but you cannot add those and get zero as if they're numbers. Once one of the integrals fails to exist, the entire thing fails to exist. Any questions about this um, aspect of improper integrals? Let's see. Anything else I want to say? What we're really lacking here is application. So I might try to do applications on Thursday. Um, for now, let's move on. This is a very lengthy section of the textbook. We've spent already like one and a half classroom sessions on it and we're still not done. Um, way back yesterday, I said there were two types of improper integrals. And we've been looking at the first type. And the first type is where you have a vertical asymptote. So the second type of improper integral and the explanation for why I keep accidentally writing those infinity symbols. Is something that looks like this. Um, the integral where one of the limits of integration are infinite, or even where both the limits of integration are infinite. You could have something that looks like this, or less commonly, much less commonly, you could have something 
that looks like this. Or you could even have something that looks like this. And we're going to dwell on this a little. Um, it looks like we don't always have time, but it looks like next week we're going to have time to talk about probability just a bit. And there we'll see integrals that look like that are actually super important to this very applied field of mathematics. Integrals that look like this are also very important. I don't know if they're as important in probability so much as they are in, well, in a wide variety of applied settings, actually. Let's just figure out how to take this integral and let's do some examples and then we can talk about applications tomorrow. So, The situation we're in, and again, I'm thinking about the integral as the area under a curve, just because that's the easiest picture to draw. We're looking at something like e to the negative x from one to infinity. And we're looking at the area under this curve. And the region under this curve is in one sense infinite. I mean, it goes on and on and on over to the right. But we've already seen now examples where we have these never-ending regions, but the area under them is still finite. So it's perfectly possible that the area under this curve will turn out to be finite. Um, Let's see if we can work this out. Um, there are no vertical asymptotes, but the way we deal with this is extremely similar to the way we dealt with improper integrals in other cases. Um, how do you think we should find this? I mean, it's once again going to be a limit. Let's give this some thought. So if we want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, that infinity sign has got to go. You can't stick infinity into <laughs> equation. So, just as we did in these previous situations, we'll replace infinity with a now finite number. And you can probably This picture is a little, because this goes to zero so fast. Let me try to make this more visible. We'll go to just like negative 0.5 and we'll go to positive 1.1. So we can see a little more of this. 
And then we can't go to infinity, but we can go to any finite n. I mean, what we're going to do is we're going to let, I'm letting n get bigger and you can't really see it because I'm not also increasing the magnification, but n can be any finite number. We're sort of interested in what happens as n goes to infinity. You can think of that as what happens as n gets bigger and bigger. So that limit that I accidentally wrote like three times already and kept telling you that I was making this mistake because we we're going to be using that limit in a minute. The limit as n goes to infinity of this integral. So, for example, the the integral I put on the board or on Desmos is the limit as n goes to infinity from zero to n e to the negative x dx is the limit as n goes to infinity. Be a little careful, but tell me what the antiderivative of e to the negative x is. It is exactly negative e to the negative x. Thank you very much. So if that's not clear, if we didn't have a negative sign, the integral of e to the u would just be e to the u. So we're doing a quick bit of U substitution. DU is negative DX. We don't have a negative sign, so we have to put one in. which is where this negative sign here comes from. Negative e to the u, negative e to the negative x. Thank you again. So we're going from zero to n. See negative e to the negative n minus negative e to the negative zero. And this simplifies. This negative sign and this negative sign turn into addition. E to the power of zero is one, because anything to the power of zero is one. And then um, 
you may end up having to use your calculators, for example, here. Um, we don't necessarily have as much intuition about taking limits as we go to infinity. We can't use continuity and just stick infinity in. Well, I say that. I mean, it's a little informal, but this might be the easiest way to think about it. Negative one over e to the n, and we stick infinity in there. And then anything raised to the power of infinity is infinity. And anything divided by infinity is zero. And if anybody asks, I didn't tell you you could take limits this way, but this is probably how most mathematicians take these limits in their head, <laughs> even if they wouldn't ordinarily write down that very sloppy notation for their students to see. I mean, if you can't figure this out algebraically, the alternative is to say, well, what does y equals e to the n look like as n goes to infinity? And you see, well, as n goes to infinity, this is going to the x-axis. This is going to zero. Okay, we'll finish this up tomorrow. It's uh, quite a lengthy section, but that's because it's an important one.